In this video, we'll be going through the design walkthrough of this project. This uh, PCB design features the ESP32 S3, a microphone array, a battery and USB-C power system, and a PCB antenna, all packed into a compact, power-efficient wearable device intended for real-time transcription and effortless note-taking. As an overview, this is what we'll be covering. We'll take a look at a high-level block diagram of the design and discuss how different functional parts will work. We'll also look at the power management and distribution plan. We'll then look at the RF design and the antenna we used in this project. We'll also look at the microphone array and the ADC circuit and discuss some design choices there as well. And finally, we'll take a look at the PCB layout and routing for this compact design. You can find a link to the actual design of this project and all other resources mentioned in this video in the description box below. With that out of the way, let's get started. This block diagram gives us a high level overview of the major components, how they interact and what protocols they will be using for communication. At the heart of this system is the ESP32 S3 which will handle all the data processing and communication. And as you can see, it's connected to different subsystems, each serving different purposes in the design. This design is to be powered by a LiPo battery, which supplies power to the rest of the system through this LDO that provides a stable 3.3 volt supply. I'll also have a MOSFET based automatic switch, which is implemented to disconnect the battery while the charger is connected just so that the system can be powered directly by the USB source while the battery charges independently. And this IC will be the one responsible for recharging the battery. One of the key features of this design is this mic array here, which is built using multiple analog MEMS microphone. I'll just be using a kind of natural distribution configuration for the array to allow for fancy processing of the audio signals later on when I'm writing the firmware. The array captures sound, which is then sent to this ADC for high fidelity digital conversion before reaching the microcontroller. And then we'll be connecting some control buttons, uh, status LEDs, and a JTAG interface for testing, programming, and debugging. We'll also talk a little bit about the RF interface and the PCB antenna and how I designed that for this application. But for now, let's jump to Flux and start by looking at the power management circuit. The power management circuit starts with these two connectors. This is where I'll be connecting the battery and this is the USB-C receptacle. I'm using the MCP7383-2 charging IC from Microchip just for its simplicity. A key design decision here is choosing the appropriate charging current based on the battery's capacity. The charging current is typically set between half C and one C, and here C represents the battery capacity in milliamp hour. That means if our battery, for example, has a capacity of 200 milliampere's hour, we can set the charging current between 100 milliampere's or 200 milliamps. And the charging IC allows us to set the charging current using this uh, prog pin. For example, using this equation, you can find that to set the charging current to 100 milliampere's, you have to use a 10K resistor here and it will charge the battery connected to this connector with 100 milliamps. Then I have this MOSFET based automatic switch to control power flow between the USB source and the battery. When USB power is connected, the MOSFET disconnects the battery from the load, ensuring the system is only powered directly by USB while the battery charges separately. And finally, in this section, I have this LDO from Diodes Incorporated, which provides a steady 3.3 volt supply for the microcontroller and other components in the design. Speaking of the microcontroller, let's take a look at it now. You might have noticed how these parts have this logical sectioning that gives an indication of what pins are there. For example, here you'd expect to get the power pins um, this section contains the GPIO pins and then you have these clock pins here. If you want to learn how to make these parametric symbols, there's a link in the description box below that describes how to create these schematic symbols in Flux. 
Okay, so for this design, I created this symbol like this so that I have a clear overview of how and where things are to be connected. At the top, I have my power pins and you can see all the decoupling capacitors here. For this design, I simply transfer the typical application circuit from the ESP32 hardware design guidelines, which is pretty standard and will suffice for our case. I've included multiple ceramic capacitors, typically 100 nanofarads and 10 microfarads, um, and here are the VDD pins to filter out noise and provide a smooth power rail. The ESP32 operates at 3.3 volts, so the LDO we discussed earlier ensures a stable voltage supply to the MCU. Next, I have the SPI flash memory from Renesas connected to the microcontroller. This external flash will be the storage for our firmware, and it follows the standard SPI connection using the dedicated flash pins of the ESP32. The flash memory is powered through the VDD SPI pin, which provides a dedicated 3.3 volts, and that's what you see here. I also wanted a way to add visual feedback for different system states, so I added this user LED. It's connected through a MOSFET, allowing it to be controlled, while also minimizing current draw from the microcontroller. The ESP32 includes a native USB OTG interface, and that means I can connect the USB differential pair directly to the microcontroller like this. Apart from that, I also wanted to expose the JTAG interface. So as you can see here, I added these test pads for that. You could use normal pin header connectors and I should have probably done that, but I just wanted to use these test pads for this fast revision. I've also included a reset button to manually reset the microcontroller when needed. The reset pin is connected through the debounce capacitor to prevent unintended resets that might arise from noise or accidental presses. This pin should not be left floating, so I pull it high, which is the on state and which enables the microcontroller. The ESP32 requires an external 40 MHz crystal oscillator for clock generation. I selected this one and you can do this by asking Copilot or if you know exactly what you want, you can search for it in the parts library using these filters. After that, I calculated the load capacitors using this equation and placed them right here. The hardware design guideline recommends adding a series resistor on this path to reduce the impact of high frequency harmonics on the RF performance and I've done just that. The ESP32 features an integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module and in this design, I'm using a PCB antenna similar to the one used in the WROOM module. Proper RF layout is crucial to ensure good signal strength and minimal interference. Since I've strictly followed the expressive PCB design guideline, I can use the matching network recommended in the hardware design guidelines, ensuring optimal impedance matching and performance. And we'll see how we've placed and routed that a bit later on when we are looking at the PCB design. In the analog section, we have these three microphones forming our microphone array and for each microphone, we are connecting the bias voltage generated by the ADC. The microphones are connected in a differential configuration and that's why you're seeing the plus and minus pins connected and this is just to reduce noise and interference that might arise. So I'm routing the microphones output through these DC blocking capacitors which are sized with this equation here. I want my cutoff frequency to be about 20 Hz and the input impedance here is selectable. You can choose between 2.5K, 10K or 20K. The default is 2.5K and that's what I went with here. Plugging those values, I get the size of the capacitor to be about 3 microfarads. Each microphone is connected to a dedicated ADC input channel which enables individual signal processing. In this ADC, we have our power pins here and the bypass capacitors as specified in the reference design. Down here, we have our digital pins. Uh, remember, this is an analog to digital converter. And so this is how we'll be sending the data to our microcontroller for processing. These I to C pins will be used to configure this ADC. Remember, we need to set a bunch of parameters. For example, if we wanted to change the input impedance or the programmable gain amplifier or something else, we do that using these pins. 
the ADC GPIO pin is just a general purpose pin and that can be used as an interrupt pin or serve other functions. And then we have our I2S pins here and these are used for transmitting the audio data. And finally, this control pin, which we can pull low to make the ADC go into a low power shutdown mode, helping us conserve power. And that's it for the schematic. Let's now take a look at the PCB layout and routing of this design. Remember, this is intended to be a wearable device. And so the biggest constraint here is real estate. However, I do understand that there's a ton of room here for optimization, right? For example, having components both on the top and bottom layer will have reduced the size of this PCB drastically. But I had to make a conscious choice to have these components on the top layer because on a later revision, I'll be including a camera sensor and it will be going on the bottom layer. So I'm kind of already planning ahead here. And I totally understand if your first instinct was to jump in the comments and raise that issue up. All right, let's get back to the design. Here, I won't go deep into component placing, but I've linked a video in the description if you want to know some of the best practices when it comes to placement. So check that out. Okay, this is a four layer PCB and opening my stack up editor, you can see these are some of the vias I'll be using to transition between the different layers. I have my ground net here and you can see I've set up my ground power in the top, mid layer two and the bottom layers. That's where I'll be having my ground power. And if I scroll down and find my 3.3 volts power net, here it is. You see, I have it in the mid layer one. Okay, and that's my stack up and layer configuration. When placing components, it makes sense to begin in logical sections. Here, I began with my centerpiece, which is the microcontroller, and then placed the decoupling capacitors, followed by the oscillator and then the flush. And then we have the power section, which is mostly grouped around this area here. And on the opposite side, we have the ADC and these are the three microphone arrays. All these components are on one side, except the battery connector and the reset button. And this is simply because of the reasons which I've mentioned before. And then I placed a keep out zone for the antenna as per the design guidelines. And the rest of the space is filled with uh, continuous ground planes, uh, which are connected with stitching wheel. So after finishing placement, I routed my critical nets first and left the boring stuff to the EI auto router, which is just amazing, by the way. You should definitely try it out and check the video I've linked in the description just to get more information about the AI Auto Router. Let me know what you thought about this design. If there's something you could have done differently or any optimization you'd suggest, drop your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you'd like to see a step-by-step -step tutorial of this design or any other design, please leave suggestions and we'll prioritize them in the coming weeks. If you found this tutorial useful, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.